Hey everybody, buenos dias. Um, my name is Raymond Simpson. I am a museum assistant here in entomology at the Peabody Museum. Um, I am a self-professed moth nerd and I am very interested in the biodiversity and evolution of arthropoda, specifically insects. Um, today I am going to show you some of our spectacular diversity in butterflies and moths that live in the neotropics, which is basically from the southern United States all the way down to Argentina in the New World. Um, most of the specimens are preserved as dried pin material, like you can see here. Um, specimens that are collected in the wild are pinned and dried, um, and then labels are adhered to them, and they are put into the collection for scientists to come and observe and study. So one of my main passions is butterflies and moths. As you can see, the tropical region of the United of the New World, including Central and South America, has very high insect diversity. Um, lots of, like literally tens of thousands of species of butterflies and moths, which are scientifically known as Lepidoptera, occur in this region. Um, here's a good assemblage of butterflies called 88 butterflies. They're called 88 butterflies because the um, underside of them have this cool 8-8 pattern on their hind wing. So the top is very brightly colored, um, kind of blue and pink. And the bottom has this cool uh, modeled 88 pattern or just kind of cool zigzag black markings on them. So there's several themes in butterfly and moth diversity in the tropics besides just diversity. Um, and I'm going to show you some of those things today. Um, one of the most well-known types of butterflies in the tropics that you've probably seen before are called morphos. And morphos are very spectacular looking. And there's numerous species of morpho. Um, this is one particular species that's very common in Brazil, um, but it's found throughout South America. And they're very distinctive, and they have this really beautiful iridescent pattern. And as I angle the box up, you can see the pattern, the hue of the blue changes in intensity. So each butterfly has wings coated in very, very, very tiny scales um, that coat the wing. And each of those scales is like a reflector, and it reflects back the blue. So if you look at it under the microscope, it's like a prism um, where it reflects different colors. Um, but it's very strongly blue back to our eyes. And the really interesting thing about these butterflies is like you think like, okay, how are they very adaptive um, being so brightly colored? But these butterflies use this as in, this ability to basically see each other as their own species. So female butterflies of this species look like this and males look like this. That's called sexual dimorphism. So a lot of these butterflies will use color pattern as a way to recognize individuals of their own particular species. Um, also, these butterflies aren't always what they seem. So the underside of a morpho butterfly is camouflaged. So a lot of things in the tropics will not only use um, bright colors to warn predators that they don't taste good, they also use camouflage to protect themselves when they're at rest. So these butterflies will sit kind of like this. So I'm going to angle in the camera. Where the, when the butterflies folded up, you can only see this brown part. But when they open up, they flash this really beautiful blue. So they both have the advantage of camouflage and a flash of bright color to potentially starve their predators of, um, of food. <laughs> so these were. Um, these are blue morphos. Um, I have another example of morphos to show you the diversity. Um, these are actually different species. And these morphos are um, from different parts of South America. But it shows the variation um, that you can see in the tropics. And so this is um, a different color pattern of the blue morpho, um, but a different species. They have a different wing shape. And this is um, an another species that's very pearly. Um, and just like the other species I showed you, these morphos also have a really interesting underside pattern, which offers them very good camouflage. So the next, um, the next topic I'm going to mention that's very commonly encountered in the tropics is something called mimicry. Um, and mimicry is 
a topic that is kind of complex, but it's really easy to understand once you, under, once you look at it more closely. So these butterflies here are called heliconian butterflies. And heliconian butterflies have caterpillars that feed on toxic plants. So when the caterpillars grow up, when they pupate and emerge as, as um, butterflies, they will basically um, inherit the caterpillar's toxicity from eating those plants. So when you have these adults flying around, these adults are going to be toxic to birds and mammals and any other predators that might want to eat them. So in some cases, you actually have moths and other insects that will actually mimic the, um, the pattern of these heliconian butterflies. So predators basically are tricked into thinking that they are distasteful when they really aren't. So you could, as, a, as a something that doesn't taste particularly bad, you could actually, by using the coloration of a heliconian, trick predators into not eating you. So this is actually a really common thing amongst tropical butterflies. And you actually have these groups of species. It's a really good example of evolution in action because you have, even within a species, all these different colors. So all these are all the same species of heliconian butterfly. And these heliconian butterflies are basically adapted to different areas of South America of different colored model species. So these model species are different colors, so the mimics become the same color as well. And so over time, you have all these different associated um, butterflies and moths that kind of look like each other and also change as you go from, say, Colombia to Brazil. So another example of mimicry we see here is um, these are all types of moths. So this is an assortment of moths collected in the tropics. Um, you can see moths are much more diverse in pattern, shape, and color um, than butterflies are. And they're also more species rich. There's many tens of thousands more moths than there are butterflies pretty much anywhere you go, including the United States. So this species in particular is very interesting in that a lot of people might think this is a wasp. This is actually a moth. And this is also this is a type of Batesian mimicry, which is basically a harmless species, a moth, mimics a species that's harmful, a wasp. So through evolution, you have the basically the adaptation of the moth to evolve clear wings to look like a bee. You can see here it has clear wings. You can see my hands through it. And it has the, the really cool like yellow and black striped pattern characteristic of wasps. So any predator that sees this in the wild is going to think twice about eating it because it is very, it's very much like a wasp. A lot, even a lot of human collectors are fooled by these as far as like what species is what. And you, sometimes you have to look really closely to be able to determine them. My final box of uh, moths here is these are examples of Urania, which are actually day-flying moths. So you might think, what's the difference between a butterfly and a moth? Um, a, butterfly and a, a butterfly tends to fly during the day and a moth at night. Not necessarily. That's probably true of 90% of them. But these are good examples of moths that fly during the day. And they actually mimic swallowtail butterflies, which have these nice um, projections called tails. They call them tails in a butterfly. Um, but these moths do a pretty darn good job of mimicking a butterfly. And the only way you can really tell is by looking at their antenna. So, and the antenna of this moth doesn't have a club tip, a ball on the tip of the antenna. If usually butterflies, swallowtail butterflies, have that enlarged antenna tip. Um, so they tend to be um, easy to tell if you look at the antenna. So between lots of these butterflies and moths, you have a lot of diversity in size as well. So this is a good example of a, uh, this is called a white witch, and this is a black witch. You can see based on the scale, this is the largest moth in wingspan in the world, this um, white witch moth. And the interesting thing about this is that the, ca the, um, the uh, caterpillar was only recently, like I think people had, have photographed it, but the caterpillar still remains undescribed to this day. And if you've seen caterpillars of large moths, they could be pretty big. So it remains to be seen that this caterpillar of this butterfly, which this isn't it, it's unknown, 
if you could find the caterpillar of this butterfly, which is going to be, or this moth, which is going to be quite big, um, you can contribute to science. So even within our biggest butterflies and moth species, there's a lot of work that can be done by even people, even citizen scientists going out and studying your local area. You can make contributions to science, even on stuff like this.